Once again, welcome to our service of worship from the beautiful sanctuary of Craigie Simonton Parish Church. Delighted to have your company wherever you are watching, whether it's locally from Craigie, from Presswick, or from Simonton, or indeed from further afield. Just great to have you with us, and it's super that you're able to tune in. Today, during this service, we are seeking to remember a couple of prominent saints. And to get us underway and to give us a true sense of devotion, we have the words and the music of a beautiful hymn, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. What a lovely hymn to start with. Well, if I was to ask you a simple question, who is the patron saint of Scotland? I would assume just about everyone would get that question correct. For of course, the answer is St Andrew. However, when it apparently came to name the patron saint for Scotland, Andrew wasn't the only person to be nominated. For a man born approximately 1,500 years ago across the sea in what was Donegal was actually in frame for that honour. A man whose relics were apparently paraded before the Scottish army at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. Who am I talking about? It was, of course, Saint Columba. He was remembered as coming to the Scottish mainland aged 42 when he left his native island. And from there he came to Iona and through his endeavours it became known in a sense as the cradle of Christianity in Scotland. And so when it came to select a patron saint for Scotland, the ecclesiastical establishment of that time had a choice between Andrew and Columba. Obviously, they opted for Andrew. However, the impact and the influence of Columba cannot be denied, and today the island of Iona, in a sense, bears witness to that, especially as people in times of normality make pilgrimages to the island and, of course, the abbey. I refer to, to that because in the past week, Iona, in a sense, reopened after receiving a makeover. On Monday, the Abbey reopened after fundraising generated 3.75 million, 
And it's absolutely wonderful that people once again are being encouraged to come to Iona where they will be made most welcome. Now, as many people will be aware, the initial transformation from ruins to a historical site of attraction was pioneered by George MacLeod. He was the minister at Govan Old Parish Church in Glasgow and he became aware of the social deprivation to be found in Glasgow through unemployment and poverty. And so back in 1938, with the aim of rebuilding the ruined abbey, he sought the help of many unemployed skilled craftsmen from Glasgow to aid this project. And as a result, the Iona community was formed with offices in Govan and a presence on Iona. And as a result of George MacLeod's vision, through the years, many thousands of people have made the journey from all over the world to the tiny island of Iona, a very special location. And it's great that when faced with modernisation, the Abbey once again has been made fit for purpose here in the 21st century. Through the years, I have had the privilege of taking two church trips to Iona, where I have administered the sacrament of Holy Communion in the Abbey. And of course, the Abbey is such a special location that radiates with not just the presence of God, but this kind of wonderful sense of peace. And I've maybe told some people this story before, that the first time I took a church trip to Iona, when we celebrated Communion in the Abbey, we were accompanied by a little robin flying around, which could have been distracting, but you know, in many ways, it just highlighted the wonderful sense of creation and the presence of God. And you know, there's something also very symbolic that perhaps despite the arrival of a global pandemic, complete with health, economic and social challenges, the Abbey on Iona has still managed to raise sufficient funds to undergo the necessary upgrades, highlighting the enduring and appealing nature of Iona and all that it stands for. Indeed, Columba didn't just leave a legacy of a building that symbolised the emergence of Christianity in Scotland, but he also left behind some written words, some written words in Latin, which have been subsequently translated, such as the following poem. Alone with none but thee, my God, I journey on my way. What need I fear when thou art near, O King of night and day? More safe am I within thy hand, than if a host should around me stand. What lovely words. And now as we come to our opening prayer, if you are able to view the slide on the screen, it actually comes from the Abbey on Iona, the quiet corner. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, from our own quiet corners, from the comforts of our homes, we now seek a time in which we come before you in prayer. Therefore, allow us to disengage from all the distractions and worries that life can so often place before us. Instead, may we feel your presence, Lord God, and may this ensure that we can truly prioritise this time of devotion. May this enable us to remember that we seek to follow the examples of all the apostles and saints who have gone before us, many of whom endured lives of hardship and even suffering to promote the ways of Jesus and the emergence of Christianity. Indeed, we this day give thanks for individuals like St. Columba, who came to Iona and established a centre of Christianity that has remained a place of pilgrimage for centuries. We also give thanks for the individuals who through the years, like George MacLeod, 
who sought to use the skills of humanity to continue this wonderful legacy of faith. O oh Lord, as we come before you this day, we may lack the charisma of Columba, and we may not all have the creative vision of George MacLeod, but nonetheless we have our part to play in sustaining the ways of Christianity in our world today. And so help us in our daily lives to reflect the ways of our faith in all that we do, that we may be proud of our Christian heritage, that we may never be afraid to speak of our faith, that in all the experiences and encounters of life we may show allegiance to Christ. And so, Lord God, sustain our faith, inspire our lives, and help us to be more like Jesus. And this we ask in our Saviour's name, and now come together in unity and conviction to pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Now, appropriately enough, we have the words and the music of our second hymn. Will you come and follow me? there of the hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me? And now we head to our reading, the words of the Apostle Paul from his letter to the Romans. Words which from Paul are fairly famous, but which also radiate with a great sense of encouragement and indeed reassurance. Romans chapter 8 and as always, this will be read by Tosh. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. 
those he justified he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, as always, to Tosh. I was talking a short while ago about St. Columba on the island of Iona. Well, the influence of Columba and Iona didn't just involve Scotland, for there was another monk on Iona named Aidan, who travelled to the northeast coast of England and set up a monastery on Lindisfarne. Now, Lindisfarne, which I'm sure most people will have heard of, is a small island linked to the mainland by a causeway which is passable except during high tide. And it was on Linda's farm that Aidan set up, if you like, his centre of operation. Indeed, from Linda's farm, Aidan travelled into Northumberland, converting people to Christianity with remarkable success. However, sadly, time caught up with Aidan, and the story is told that on the night that Aidan died, a shepherd was watching his sheep on the Lammermuir Hills near Melrose. According to a local historian at the time, what the shepherd saw was a stream of light from the sky. In the midst of this, the choir of the heavenly host descending to the earth and taking with them without delay a soul of exceeding brightness. The shepherd whose name was Cuthbert, learned shortly after seeing this vision of Aidan's death, whereupon immediately he left his flock and headed to the monastery nearby. Well, to cut a long story short, Cuthbert eventually found his way to Linda's farm and, like Aidan, became greatly admired and respected by so many people. Yet what ironically propelled Cuthbert to legendary status came after he died. For upon his death, Cuthbert was buried on Linda's farm. However, approximately 11 years later, the monks decided to dig up St. Cuthbert's coffin for inspection. And to their astonishment, they found that when they opened the coffin, the corpse showed absolutely no sign of decay. And this remarkable discovery was seen as a great miracle and Columba was proclaimed as a saint. And when news of this spread, huge numbers of pilgrims travelled far and wide to Linda's farm to visit Cuthbert's shrine. Sadly, however, this was all disrupted in the 9th century when Vikings reached the northeast coast of England and the monks had to flee for their lives. However, Cuthbert had left instructions that if the monks ever left Linda's farm, they were to take his remains with them. And so they took with them the coffin of St. Cuthbert and for a number of years the monks travelled around the northeast area of England 
carrying with them St Cuthbert. And then one day, just east of Durham, the cart carrying the coffin came to an abrupt halt. Despite the efforts of the monks and some local people, they couldn't move the coffin. And so the story goes that for three days they fasted and they prayed, trying to learn why the coffin would not move. And then St Cuthbert apparently appeared to one of the monks in a vision and told him that the coffin should be taken to Dun home. Well, the monks had no idea what this meant. Dun was the Anglo-Saxon word for hill, and home meant island. Hill island? What did it mean? Well, despite not knowing where they were going, the monks, upon learning of Dun home, were now able to move the coffin. And the next part of this remarkable story is that the monks then came across a milkmaid looking for her cow. As the milkmaid asked another milkmaid if she had seen her lost cow, the reply came back, yes, the cows had done home. Well, the monks overheard this conversation and were overjoyed to hear the word done home. And thereafter, they followed the milkmaid to what appeared a peninsula surrounded by a gorge with a river flowing through. And it was in this spot that the body of St Cuthbert was laid to rest. Initially a small wooden church built to accommodate St Cuthbert. But through time a huge cathedral was erected as a shrine to St Cuthbert. And as the years passed, Dun home became easier to pronounce as Durham. And therefore today people from all over the world flock to Durham to visit that huge cathedral which was built initially as a shrine to St Cuthbert. It's quite a remarkable story and one which I think in the face of enforced change also depicts a tremendous sense of loyalty by the monks who fleeing for their own life still found the time, the determination and the energy to take the coffin of St Cuthbert with them. A man who ironically reached legendary status after his death. And you know, maybe there is an important parallel here with Jesus and his disciples. For when you think about it, it really was only after the death of Christ that the true potential and loyalty of his disciples came into force. For during his ministry, as we know, the disciples often failed in their understanding and in a sense in their loyalty to Jesus. But let's be honest, they so often struggled to comprehend. And I have to say, when Jesus talked of his death and resurrection, then perhaps if the truth be told, who could blame them? I'm sure if any of us had lived 2,000 years ago and witnessed the life of Jesus, we also would have struggled at times to understand what he, he was talking about. Indeed, with hindsight, it's easy to be critical of these men. But would any of us have fared any better? And let's not forget that these disciples were the very men that, after the ascension, went forth to convey the good news to every living soul they met. And as a result, not only did Christianity emerge, but these men faced for the rest of their lives a sense of danger and even persecution, during which time they more than made up for their faults and failings, for their loyalty was without question. And it was the same for those poor monks on Lindisfarne. Forced to flee for their lives was bad enough, but they were also accompanied, as we heard, by taking the coffin of St Cuthbert everywhere they went. St Cuthbert was no longer with them, but they were loyal to his instructions. And as a result, Christianity benefited with the emergence of a wonderful Christian site at Durham. And you know, today I can't help think that these examples of the monks and the disciples of Jesus 
are so important. For both the monks and the disciples experienced, in a sense, the departure of their leaders from the world. But that change, that change actually became the catalyst for a much greater sense of loyalty and determination. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he refers to those who have been called to serve, highlighting that Jesus died and was raised to life. And that nothing we face in this world, whatever changes and challenges come our way, they will never be able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ. And you know, we surely have to embrace that belief, whatever we face, whatever the future holds, the belief that we can succeed and we can indeed be encouraged and supported by those who have gone before. Well, as a minister through the years, I have sought to periodically inform people, often through my preaching, of the changes and challenges inflicted on our faith and on our church. And while we all, as humans, may crave a a sense of stability and growth within our churches, we are currently faced, if the truth be told, with great uncertainty and decline. Just recently, the Church of Scotland, as you may be aware, held its General Assembly in Edinburgh and discussed the way ahead, albeit online. What became obvious was that the status quo was unsustainable. Sadly, for whatever reason, there are no longer the required amount of people accepting a call to ministry. And in addition, over 35% of all the current parish ministers will retire over the next few years. And in addition, we have far too many church buildings that due to their age and even their shape are underused and very expensive to maintain. Therefore, the General Assembly acknowledged that over the next few years, there will have to be a drastic reduction in the number of parish ministers. Hence, without going into too much detail, churches will require to link, they will require to unite, and in some cases, they will require to close. If, for example, we take the Presbytery of Air, which covers all the churches in this area, as far north as Troon, as far south as Ballantrae, and as far east uh, as Muirkirk. Well, currently we have a requirement for 32 parish ministers, although about a third of our churches are currently vacant. Now, in fairness, the Presbytery of Air, in recognition of the current problems, has already been addressing the need to reduce the number from 32 for quite a few years. However, following the recent General Assembly, we have been left in no doubt about the need for more rapid change with an allocated figure of 19. It should be mentioned, and not to complicate matters, that there will also be the available availability, should I say, of having this figure of 19 complemented by a small number of additional church workers, such as youth workers and family workers, if they are available. But the crux of the matter is that we now have to reduce from the current figure of 32 parish ministers to 19. That's not speculation, that's now reality, and that is the impact of change. Now, to some people who have been members of the church for years and served the church with great enthusiasm and commitment during that time, there will perhaps be the view that they have done their bit. And I would endorse that. However, they can still play their part by supporting change, however unwelcome it may initially appear. To be understanding to the challenges faced by the church and in response to offer a sense of encouragement and inspiration for others, including those who are currently active in the church and still have much to give, 
including those who are currently perhaps on the margins of becoming more fully involved, whose time in accepting great responsibility within the church is now fast approaching. For no doubt as we look to the future, there will be many active members and some anticipating a greater involvement who view the current situation with perhaps a great sense of apprehension and even fear. Especially as it becomes evident that the leadership provided by ministers will be diminished. And while I would never compare ministers to either the leadership provided by the saints like Cuthbert or indeed our Lord Jesus Christ, the examples of the monks from Lindisfarne and the disciples of Jesus are hopefully one of both reassurance and motivation. Monks and disciples who when faced with a change that threatened their very existence rose to the challenge with a renewed sense of loyalty. And perhaps such examples are what we have to grasp at this moment in time, whereby we allow change to provide us not just with new opportunities to serve the church, but whereby a renewed sense of loyalty develops that ensures that the church emerges leaner, fitter, and perhaps even more dependent on lay members. To some people with suffer within the church and within their own lives, this could be perceived as your time, a wonderful opportunity to reflect on your own gifts and to use them accordingly. Never forgetting the examples of those who have gone before, the monks of Lindisfarne and the disciples of Jesus who in many respects only reached their potential when the leadership in which they had been so dependent was actually taken away. For it was then their loyalty shone through in times of great change and challenge. May we all therefore ensure that whatever stage we are at within our place, within Christianity and the church, that we have the sufficient loyalty to continue going forward in faith, playing our part, whatever that may be. Amen. And thanks be to God for this meditation of his holy word. Let us pray. Lord God, we live in a world of change and challenge, some of which we embrace with joy and anticipation, some of which creates fear and apprehension. Yet we acknowledge that time doesn't stand still, that we have to evolve, that we have to plan and in a sense adapt to whatever comes our way. And therefore this day we pray for our church in Scotland and for all churches across the world, especially those faced with challenges that are initially perceived as alarming and difficult. In response, may we learn from those who have gone before us, especially those who rose to the challenges that they faced, reflecting a great sense of faith, commitment and loyalty. Therefore we pray for our churches that mean so much to us. May we adapt to the changes that are before us with a sense of understanding and acceptance, praying that those with the necessary gifts, that they may serve the church with a willingness and an enthusiasm that knows no bounds. And in our prayers this day, we also think of those who have encountered changes and challenges of another kind. Those changes and challenges brought on, affecting those aspects of life that cause uncertainty, suffering and even sorrow. O Lord, in a quiet time of prayer, allow us to bring before you now those known to us who perhaps at this moment in time are struggling with life in general. Hear our prayers. O 
and now allow us to go forward, committed to the ways of Christ, loyal to his commands, and reassured by his promises. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Now we come to the words and the music of our final hymn, In Christ Alone. final hymn that was in Christ alone. I have to say one of my own personal modern hymns and it's great to have it in our service of worship. Well that almost brings to an end this service of worship and as always just thanks for being with me and until the next time take care and I hope that in the days ahead you are filled with the presence of God and all the reassurances that accompany the Christian faith. And now let me close, as always, with a short blessing. And now, Lord God, may we all go forth aware of your presence in our lives. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may they be with you all and also those whom you love, now and forevermore. Amen.